And good evening. We begin Top Story tonight with a huge day in the Alec Murdoch trial. The prosecution making their closing arguments, trying to convince the jury that Murdoch killed his wife and son at their family home. But before that began, the jury this morning giving the chance to tour the murder site firsthand. And we want to walk you through exactly what they saw and what both sides are claiming happened at that property. First thing this morning, the jurors taking roughly a 20-minute drive from the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, to this location, the former Murdoch family estate. The first stop, the kennels, which you see highlighted here, where the Murdochs kept their family hunting dogs. The jurors, who are not being shown on camera, to, of course, to protect their identities, given the chance to walk through the outdoor structure to get a sense of that space. You see that here. It's a location they had seen many times before in video. Most notably in this Snapchat, perhaps the most critical piece of evidence in this case. In the video taken by Murdoch's son on the night he was killed, Alex Murdoch's voice can be clearly heard, debunking his lie that he was not with his family in the hours before their deaths. On the stand, Murdoch testifying that right after that video was taken, he took this path all the way back to the family home, where he possibly took a nap and then went to visit his sick mother. In the time he was gone, Murdoch claimed someone else came in and killed his family near the kennels. But according to the prosecution, Murdoch only went back to the house after killing Maggie and Paul. Maggie Murdoch found dead under the roof of this converted plane hanger you see here. Her son Paul shot dead inside of the feed room, which is attached to the kennel in this corner over here. The two just steps away from each other, when they, and they were just very close to each other when both were murdered. The only person who killed them knows exactly when that happened and why they died. But what we do know, both of their phones were last unlocked at 8.49 p.m. That's just five minutes after that Snapchat video with Alec Murdoch in it was taken. Here to put some of the final moments of this trial together, Katie Beck tonight leading us off once again from outside that South Carolina courthouse. Alec Murdoch was living a lie and would do anything to protect it. That's why the prosecution says he was the only one with motive and means to murder. The forensic timeline puts him there. Prosecutors describe a gathering storm, unbearable pressure bearing down on Murdoch in the weeks and months before the murders. Confronted for stealing money from his firm and about to be financially exposed by a civil case after the 2019 boat crash involving his son Paul. And they were all reaching a crescendo the day his wife and son were murdered by him. Prosecutors again pointing to the lie Murdoch admitted on the stand that he was never at the kennels that night. When was the last time I saw my wife and child alive? Why in the world would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that? And a graphic description of Alex shooting Paul in the feed room with the family gun and Maggie, who heard and saw the horrific moment just moments before her own death. She was running to her baby, heard that shot, and was running to her baby when she got mowed down. Reminding the jury of how moments after the murders, Murdoch struggled to explain why he was tracking so many steps and why some details, the ones that help him, are crystal clear in an ever-changing manufactured alibi story. He's asking questions like that. He's trying to figure out what do the police have. Replaying various interviews Alec gave investigators. I stayed on the couch and I dozed off. The crime scene shown to the jury Wednesday morning, taken from the court to the 1,700-acre Moselle property to walk the kennels, the feed room, and the outside of the former Murdoch home. Prosecutors concluding their arguments with this. He's fooled them all. And he fooled Maggie and Paul, too. And they paid for it with their lives. Don't let him fool you, too. All right, Katie Beck joins us tonight from Waterboro, South Carolina, once again. Katie, what more can you tell us about the jury's visit to the scene of the murders today? 
Well, as you know, Tom, these jury visits are exceptionally rare. They almost never happen because they are a logistical nightmare. But this one was pretty organized. They were able to get all of the jury into a van with black tinted windows and drive them 25 minutes from where I'm standing to the Moselle property. They were able to take the tour of the kennels and the tour of the house. And one person we spoke to that attended a Wall Street Journal reporter who was sort of the pool reporter for everyone described the gravity of being there and just how the jurors were very stoic, were very concentrated, were really deep in thought. I mean, these are people that have heard six weeks of testimony about this very specific place and the brutality that happened there. Um, this Wall Street Journal reporter who happens to be writing a book said that she herself was brought to tears just thinking about that feed room, what happened there, how perhaps Maggie Murdoch was watching as her son uh, took his last breaths. So she said the experience was a bit eerie, um, the property a bit haunted, and that it certainly had an emotional impact uh, for sure. Yeah, the scene of a horrific crime, no doubt. What do we expect to hear tomorrow from the defense in their closing arguments? Well, I think the defense is going to point out that there have been 75 witnesses in this case, and not a single one has painted this family dynamic as anything but loving. And they're probably also going to point out that if Alec Murdoch's true motive, as the prosecution laid out in opening statements, was for sympathy and distraction, he really didn't achieve it. Um, soon after these murders, he was disbarred and disgraced, and all of those financial crimes that he was trying to escape came to light pretty soon after. So I think they're going to point those things out, and then they're going to point to the largely circumstantial nature of this case that we've heard time and again, that we don't have a murder weapon, that SLED did a sloppy investigation, and that they really have not been able to prove the evil motive, the reason that Alec would kill his own son and kill his wife. Okay, Katie Beck leading us off here. Katie, we appreciate all your reporting. For more on the final moments of this trial and where this case stands now, let's bring in criminal trial attorney and TV host, a friend of Top Story, Sarah Azari. And tonight we're excited to have Richard Gabriel in the house, a trial consultant, including an expert on jury research who's worked on such major trials like O.J. Simpson, Casey Anthony, and Aaron Hernandez. Thank you to both for being here tonight. Sarah, at the heart of the prosecution's closing arguments was the phrase, a manufactured alibi. Powerful. But do you think that prosecutor was effective today in his messaging, or was he rambling? Was he too long-winded? And what some describe as a coma-inducing PowerPoint presentation that seemed to go on forever. Sarah, the mic is yours. Yeah, it was, uh, Tom, it was extra. Like, it was his... Uh, uh, presentation of the evidence and uh, some of his own colleagues behind him were slouched over and snoozing. It was really tough to follow and I imagine the jury had a hard time following him. Um, but here's what really stood out to me. As much as he focused on motive and the big lie, the idea that he was at the kennels and lied to investigators time and time and again, and that he's a prolific liar, he lied to everybody, he's lying to you, he did not once mention in a murder trial the crime scene. Not once. That was astonishing to me. And it was telling about how much the state lacks evidence here. And that is what's fodder for the defense tomorrow. You know, focusing on motive, saying that June 7th of 2021, the storm was descending on Alec Murdoch. Well, the defense is going to show that that was just an ordinary day in the life of a thieving, conning, drug addicted Alec Murdoch who was living in debt for years. You know, the, the only extraordinary thing about June 7th was the murder of his wife and son. Um, you know, the lies. I think, uh, Tom, the, de the defense is going to um, diminish the big lie into something that may not be relevant by putting it into the context of while he was lying to investigators, he was also pressing them for what he believed was exculpatory evidence from the GPS data, from, you know, the car data, the phone data. So, you know, when you put it in context, you, this jury is going to look not just to what his testimony is and what he said to the investigators, but what can be corroborated, what makes sense, what is, you know, and he used the word common sense, common user sense. That's going to matter to this jury, the idea that they have to use their common sense and apply it to what they can, you know, objectively um, decide without having to look at his testimony and his lying. Richard, speaking of the jury, that's one of your expertise is reading these people, watching them, seeing how they're reacting to the evidence. High-profile, high-paid defense attorneys pay you a lot of money to do this. 
Let's talk about the, the field trip, if you will, today, because when, when you worked on the O.J. Simpson trial, there was also that field trip to the, the murder scene, the double murder scene. Um, what does that do for a jury, and what do you think it did in this case? Well, I think it's crucial in this case. I mean, in O.J., it was a little bit different because we wanted to give jurors a sense of, of who the man was. It really wasn't the crime scene. Um, in the Phil Spector case, which I also worked on, it was important because there was a lot of spatial relationships. For these jurors, they've been hearing testimony for weeks and weeks about what it was. And as everybody said, it lends a real gravitas, and they can measure three basic things. Um, the distance from the house, the, the sound, that can travel from the house and also um, just just the spatial relationship that feed room is really small and they're want to find out number one what is the timing on this can he get to the house if he didn't do it did he take a nap did he hear the gunshots where were the dogs barking all of that becomes so much clearer for the jurors when they're actually there can look it out and it, it helps them when they inevitably sometimes do reenactments in the jury room to try and figure out how he could have done this. Speaking of the jury, there, there was this moment when, when Murdoch took the stand, right? And he sort of shocked the courtroom. But he did take the stand. He was cross-examined. There was a part where he got emotional. And, and it's reported that a juror handed him a tissue to wipe away tears. Th that, to me, speaks volumes. Should it? Well, you know, in a circumstantial case, character is king. Jurors are clearly, he's going to be the centerpiece of this case. And either they're going to say, look, mm -hmm. there's nobody that is that good an actor that can weep that profoundly over the loss of their wife and son and keep it up. Where, or he is a psychopath and he can manufacture that emotion. He has no conscience and he can, he can do all this just to you hide it. You shouldn't read in that, that by handing him the tissue, he somehow won them over, at yeah. least in that moment? I, I don't think so, because the truth is that jurors can actually feel real sympathy for a thing and still convict them if they right. feel that. Sarah, prosecutors rounding out their arguments, right, with the theory because there was no murder weapon, that essentially the murder weapon was one of the mm. family rifles, right? I think it's called a blackout rifle. It was mm. never found, but it was a rifle that they mm. used in the family. They had expert testimony here. How effective do you think that was? Well, look, um, Alec, that's one of the statements where I believe Alec Murdoch was just confused because that blackout, the th uh, 300 blackout, was lost once and then replaced. And the theory of the prosecution is that the replacement blackout is the murder weapon. And I don't think Alec Murdoch was understanding which 300 blackout they were referring to in the interview. But, but ultimately, you know, this is a battle of experts, Tom. And um, which expert has more credibility? Captain Phone Tosser, who we heard from yesterday, the rattled pathologist, or the defense experts? I mean, this jury has to decide because there really isn't, there's no blood. There's no, really no DNA. There's no forensics in this case. And that's why uh, I think also to Richard's point, this um, uh, jury view is also very important because in listening to these um, experts and their analysis, this jury now is able to do its own analysis, you know, with respect to the gunshots, the direction and all of that. So it was very important. Richard, you, you've seen so many murder trials, right? And, and you've been paid to, to add your expertise to this. You've been following this one pretty closely as well. What do you think happens? <laughs> well, the truth is that most jurors at this point have probably made up their minds. Even without closing arguments, after six weeks of trial, they're pretty much have got it or lean heavily. What really happens at this point, it is a matter of dynamics. Who are the personalities? Who are the two to three jurors that are really going to lead this juror? What are the differences? How can they actually negotiate reality? Closing arguments really about arming your advocates to, to really make the arguments and to influence others. Obviously, the defense is looking... They don't need all 12. They can only have one or two or more. What's your sense so far from, from, from the prosecution versus the defense? Oh, it's such a coin toss here. It really you, depends you on the you people. You think it's a coin toss? Okay. I do, I do. I think it's very difficult to say. It, because I would know more because I think another piece of evidence that is not in the case itself is what these jurors thought of the Murdochs prior to coming there. It's a small county. Right. Everybody knows them and they, they have know their the opinions. Name. Sarah, real quick because we're running out of time. Where do, where do you think this trial goes? Gosh, I mean, I would be shocked that this is uh, this would be a. I mean, jurors have broken my heart over the years, but I would be shocked that this is a guilty verdict. I think it's going to be a hung verdict. Uh, but if you ask me what it should be, I think it should be a not guilty. I think the state has not met its burden beyond a reasonable doubt. With that, 
we will end this segment. Sarah Zari, Richard Gabriel, we thank you both for your expertise and your time tonight here on Top Story. We want to get to some breaking news just in. The TSA says an explosive device was found in check luggage at Lehigh Valley International Airport in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Play police say at least one person is now in custody. I want to get right over to NBC's Valerie Castro with the details just coming in. Valerie, what do you know? Tom, this happened Monday morning when the FBI says 40-year-old Mark Muffley showed up at the airport and checked in a piece of luggage at the Allegiant Airline ticket counter. About half an hour later, the bag was screened by the TSA and it set off an alarm. According to the arrest affidavit, investigators found a circular compound three inches in diameter wrapped in wax-like paper and clear plastic wrap. They say it was hidden in the lining of the suitcase. Now, at that point, the airport was evacuated and the FBI was called in. A bomb technician examined the device and determined it was an explosive after finding what appeared to be a fuse and a mixture of powder suspected to be the kind used in commercial grade fireworks. Security cameras then helped investigators identify Muffley as he was leaving the airport after his name was called over the PA system asking him to report to the security desk. Those images were compared to his driver's license photo with the help of local law enforcement. He was arrested at his home Monday night. He is charged with possession of an explosive in an airport and attempting to have placed an explosive or incendiary device on an aircraft. Tom. Okay, Valerie Castro with that breaking news tonight. Valerie, we appreciate it. We have been following the monster winter storm in California all week. Take a look at M Mammoth Mountain in the Sierra Nevadas. Snow remo removal efforts and avalanche control now underway after this week's storm brought up to 68 inches of snow to the mountain. And an avalanche at Mount Baldy in San Bernardino County blocking roads. Some residents in California's mountain communities trapped in their homes. You see why they don't have power and they haven't had it for days. For more on the winter weather conditions out west and where the storm is headed next, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins us live in studio tonight. Bill, so talk to us about those poor people in California and where all this is going. Yeah, it's already spreading into the middle of the country. I mean, this storm is so dynamic. We've had a tornado warning in the last half hour for Hot Springs, Arkansas. And this storm is going to head in the general direction of Little Rock. So we've got to keep a close eye on that in the next half hour. This area is under a tornado watch until 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. And there's a new tornado warning just to the west here or just to the east of Memphis. So, again, isolated tornadoes tonight, maybe one or two strong. Tomorrow's the big day. Tomorrow's a very dangerous day. If you were anywhere from the Dallas-Fort Worth area to Austin, anywhere in northeast, East Texas, the southeastern uh, corner of Oklahoma, Texarkana, Little Rock, Shreveport, Alexandria, up to Memphis. Be, have your plans aware. You could go under a tornado warning at any time tomorrow, maybe even strong tornadoes, too, even after sunset. So tomorrow's a very dangerous day in the south. And then we take this through the southeast, everywhere from Knoxville to Charlotte, Carol South Carolina, and Georgia on Friday. As far as the winter storm goes, we've finally shut off the snow machine in the mountainous areas. Now it's a snowstorm for areas from Flagstaff northwards. And this storm is going to be on the move, and it will dump some heavy snow, Tom. By the time we get to Friday, Chicago to Detroit will get heavy snow, and even northern New England. So it's about three more days of this storm to go. Wow. Okay, we will stay on top of all of it, Bill. We appreciate it. Now to power and politics, and a lot of political news to get to tonight, including several new polls indicating that former President Trump's presidential campaign is heating up showing him beating Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in a head-to-head -head matchup. Three different polls. These numbers coming as CPAC begins, the conservative political conference, an event known to gather the most influential Republicans that many, though, are skipping this year. And on the Democratic side, NBC News and Puck News reporting on the Biden-Harris 2024 re-election plan or lack thereof. I want to bring in our expert political panel in tonight, Tara Palmieri, Puck News senior political correspondent, who's done a lot of reporting on the Biden and Trump campaigns. Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch. And Zach Patankis, Democratic strategist and president of Patankis Strategies. We thank you for joining us all. Stephen Hayes, I think we have him. There he is. All right. Good looking guy. I want to make sure we have him up there in the satellite. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to start with you to start to ask you about these, these new polling numbers. All these polls conducted in February, just days apart with similar results. What do you make of this? Because, I mean, you can't deny the Trump bump, if you will, in these recent polls. And it's interesting, right, because DeSantis has been getting more and more media coverage. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I think if you're one of the rival campaigns, one of the potential rival campaigns, this has to come as such a warning shot, even if we have to say these polls are very, very early. And I think that the, the conventional wisdom is that Donald Trump has somewhere between a quarter or a third of the Republican Party who are true, hardcore Trump supporters. They're Trump supporters before they're Republican Party uh, devotees. And 
The argument I would make if I were advising one of the Republican candidates is that what we've seen from these candidates so far, where they are sort of half running but not really wanting to antagonize Donald Trump, take him on, even criticize him in any way, that's not going to work. The only way to bring Donald Trump's numbers down is to criticize him, to attack him, to take him on. And if you have people who act like they're running more to be his running mate than as an opponent, it's not going to work. When you say that, are you talking about uh, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley? Yeah, Nikki Haley, um, among others. I mean, Nikki Haley and Tim Scott both took direct questions asking them just to lay out their policy differences with Donald Trump. And they both sort of refused. Um, you know, Tim, Tim Scott went on and said, I'm so grateful that Donald Trump was president of the United States. They didn't really lay out their, their policy differences in any way. I think that's an easy question. You don't have to attack him. I, I, my own answer would be something like I would uphold and defend the Constitution, which presidents are sworn to do, unlike Donald Trump. Uh, but then walk through some policy differences. You're going to eventually have to get there. Might as well get started now. Tara, former President Trump and Governor Ron DeSantis are being sort of seen as the front runners here. The polls show that. You have a lot of sources w within the Republican Party. What's the sense now, right? If you're somebody who's on the fence about whether to jump in or, or, or not jump in, I get it's really early. I get it's just three polls. It's a snapshot right. in time. But you got to raise money. You got to put together a team. You, you got to have some kind of motivation to get into the race. And it's tough if, if Donald Trump this early is going to suck up all the oxygen. Absolutely. I think um, a lot of the entrants, particularly the ones that are already wealthy and able to self-fund, they're thinking, why not come in after the Trump and DeSantis slugfest? People like Glenn Youngkin, people like Rick Scott, um, even uh, Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire, has said that he would enter the race late in the end of summer, possibly fall. That's around the time of the first debates. Um, they're thinking that they want to let the two frontrunners duke it out. One of them falls, and they come out weakened. Then there's a dark horse entrance that people, you know, are craving for at the time. But it's a risky strategy, because how how are you supposed to have a ground game? How are you supposed to get the best consultants? How are you supposed to get um, a message out there? And uh, I think this is really for people who aren't willing to go up against Trump head on. And I'm, you're already seeing that the people who will enter the race early because they have to to raise money, Mike Pompeo, um, Mike Pence, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, they're not willing to take Trump head on. If anything, they're all attacking Ron DeSantis. They've all been firing away at him. So has Trump. And maybe that's why you're seeing DeSantis' numbers drop a little you bit, know, because everyone's aiming their fire at him. Right. Zach, I also have a different theory. Could, could this be less about President Trump and Ron DeSantis and more about President Biden? President Biden has had some really tough poll numbers recently. We see this sort of rise with President Trump. And I wonder if Republican voters are saying, Look, we we're so upset with President Biden. Life is so expensive in the U.S. right now. We know at least former President Trump will take it to Joe Biden. No, I, I don't think that's it at all, because we see all this in 2016. I mean, this is not very complicated. Re Republican-based voters really like Donald Trump. You know, and in a Republican primary, you don't need to yeah, win but it's a majority. Growing, right, it's, it was going down, and now it's, it's growing. That's the difference. Right, yeah. but I mean, again, he is the most popular Republican politician in the Republican Party, and that, it is not anything more complicated than that. They like uh, his policies. They like that he wants to pass a national abortion ban. He li like these stuff about him. And um, and so I think we, you know, we can, at the end of the day, it really looks like Donald Trump is going to be the nominee, just like it did from the beginning of when Donald Trump got in the race. He had this, uh, he had a lead in the polls um, then. And he kept it through the entire time. And everybody tried all sorts of different things. Remember, he had Lindsey Graham come out with the with the sword, and you had... Yeah, uh, they tried everything in 2016. You know, and right. Marco Rubio and the... And the and the, the name calling. The name right. calling. You know, at the end of the day, Republican voters like Donald Trump and the primary system that they have, the winner take all system, allows someone to, if you have the most votes, um, to, uh, to, to get the nomination. But a lot's happened since 2016. There's a lot of soul searching in the party. Stephen, I want to bring this next question to you. Ahead of CPAC, there, there's a lot of conversation surrounding what is the direction of the Republican Party, right? You have a lot of people skipping out on CPAC. Your news outlet, The Dispatch, I think called it a freak show. It used to be at one point a place where conservatives went. And now I want to show you this. These are two competing headlines written by two conservative writers, one from your news organization, the other by Matt Lewis from The Daily Beast. One says why Reaganism can beat Trumpism in 2024, the other completely saying the opposite. Pence is the Reagan Republican no one wants anymore. So, Stephen, what I'm getting at to here 
is where is the direction of the Republican Party? It seems so fractured. And I kind of always go back to this on this show, but I think a fractured Republican Party helps only one person. That's Donald Trump. Well, I mean, obviously, the argument presented in the dispatch was the more persuasive argument, um, <laughs> I have to say. No, look, I, I think I think there's a there, this is a real contest of ideas. This the, the most interesting and exciting debate in American politics over the next couple of years is going to be exactly the question that you're raising right now. The, the argument that we ran by a, a contributor named John Hart today at the dispatch said, if you look at people like Nikki Haley, you look at somebody like Tim Scott, they're sunnier in disposition. They have some of the characteristics that Ronald Reagan had. They, they make arguments that are more consistent with a Reagan vision of the Republican Party than a dark sort of grievance driven vision that Donald Trump has run on uh, over the past eight years. I think they're right. I think there's an argument for that. I would caveat it by saying you've got to make the argument, though. I mean, if, if you're Nikki Haley and you're going way out of your way to avoid criticizing Donald Trump or even really making anything beyond a generational argument and talking about being optimistic, I think you're missing the, the chance to make the argument. So there's a, there's a case to be made there. I think it can be a winning case. We'll see if anybody's willing to actually make it. I think a lot of people believe there's a lane against former President Trump. They're just trying to figure out who that person is or, the, or, or what exactly that lane is. I do want to turn to the Democrats now. Zach, I want to come to you to talk about a, a report NBC had a couple weeks ago, and, and we'll put the, the headline up on the screen. It was titled, Biden Team Faces Challenge to Fill Top Job with a Complicated Set of Duties. And in the article, it says this, the campaign manager and other top staff are likely to function more as implementers than deciders, a reality that has been a tough sell for some seasoned political professionals. Do you want to take on a job that has five bosses, said one source familiar with the process, granted anonymity to discuss internal conversations? Look, Zach, it's never an easy job to be the campaign manager on a re-election campaign when you have the entire White House advising you every 10 minutes and people constantly blowing up your cell phone. But why can't Joe Biden find a campaign manager? <laughs> I, I'm laughing because the idea, I mean, in, in our world, political operative world, the campaign manager for the re-election for president of the United States is one of the most coveted jobs in the yeah, business. So why isn't so someone stepped up? So this is why I absolutely do not believe that they're having trouble finding this job. It is a different job than running an open race, but it comes with its own set of opportunities, like a record that, that uh, Joe Biden can run on, as opposed to just making promises. He can talk about how he got, he's getting prescription drug costs down. We just made an announcement today about insulin capping it at $35. Eli Lilly is, is, doing, is doing that. That's it for Medicare recipients across, but, but across the But there's headwinds, including a majority of Democrats Democrats don't want him to run, according to polls. I mean, uh, polls at this point are, are absurd. At the end of the day, Donald Trump, uh, President Biden would not only uh, win a uh, Democratic primary, if someone decided to challenge him, he would run away with it. On that point, I want to bring in Tara, because Tara, I know you have some great reporting on Biden's current vice president. Um, it's called, Can Harris Rewrite Her Narrative in Time for 2024? This is from your site, Puck News. And you cited an, an, an op-ed Obama White House counsel Greg Craig titled Biden's Succession Problem. This is from the New York Times. In the article, Craig says giving voters a chance to participate in selecting Mr. Biden's running mate in 2024 would address the issues of age and succession. It would show him to be confident, engaged, unafraid, farsighted and even vital. So you have a Democrat who worked in the White House under the Obama-Biden administration, I should say, basically suggesting we should have a, an election for vice president, for the running mate at these conventions. Right. You pose this to, to a former aide to Kamala Harris, one, one of her closest advisors. What did you, what did you learn? Basically, they are um, completely dismissing it. They think it's ridiculous. They think this chatter is common. Um, there's always a question about, you know, around electability. Oh, do we drop the person on the ticket to get uh, another, you know, person who could add more electability? That's basically what the vice president is all about, right, anyway. I mean, you're adding an electability factor to the president, and perhaps they don't think that uh, Because Harris there's the issue is of his boost. age also, right? There, there, there's oh, a fear right, exactly. that he gets reelected and he can't finish out the term. Exactly. So I think that there's more scrutiny on um, Vice President Harris and that she's even more at the top of the ticket than most vice presidents because of his age. And some people are voting, thinking this person may not be able to serve out his entire term. So I'm actually looking at the vice president as if she is the president. And I think that's what he's arguing, is that give people the choice of the number two, because you may end up seeing that person in the top role. What, what, what um, is your sense people... about that? About that? I know it hasn't been announced, but what's your sense about the, the re-election on the Democratic side? I mean, is there excitement there? Is there confusion? 
confusion? Is there a hesitancy? I think there's a lot of different mixed feelings, but I think ultimately, and they're all the feelings you just named, mainly because of President Biden's age and what that means. And, you know, his poll numbers are okay, but, and he's done a lot, but at the end of the day, you're still trying to sell someone who will be 86 by the end of their term. And it's difficult. And I think there's just a lot of confusion about what to do. And, you know, He's also unlikely to face a primary challenger. The party seems to be, sh like, sh shouldering on. But there are a lot of people who are quietly wondering if they would have a better nominee to run against Trump or DeSantis or someone else. And, you know, in the meantime, people in are also talking about, well, maybe there's a better running mate for, for uh, President Biden. And I think that's just a lot of last resort talk when really the top of the ticket is the number one thing that people are focused on right now rather than the vice president. But at the same time, to strengthen the ticket, they're saying, well, why can't we help Kamala Harris rewrite her narrative and maybe we can sell her as more of a front runner? We're going to have to leave it there. We, I thank you, Tara, Stephen, Zach, for the robust conversation tonight. We appreciate it. We want to turn out to an NBC News exclusive we have here on Top Story. The Department of Homeland Security announcing today the agency is widening its investigation into migrant children found cleaning slaughterhouses. The agency now examining whether or not a human smuggling scheme brought those children to work in the United States for multiple companies across multiple states. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has been following the story closely. She broke the story on Top story months ago. Julia, what, what more can you tell us about this shift in the investigation? Well, Tom, this is an expansion. When this first began, we knew that there was this one slaughterhouse in Grand Island, Nebraska. Labor investigators went in and found children, some as young as 13, working in the middle of the night, cleaning blood and animal parts off the floors. They expanded that investigation and found that that company, PSSI, actually employed over 100 children across 13 different sites in eight states. Now what we're learning, it's not just that one company. In fact, DHS is now working with the FBI to launch a multi-state, multi-company probe where they believe that smugglers may have brought children from Central America and part of an elaborate scheme where they would steal the identities of U.S. citizens, give them to the children so that they could pass as American adults and get these very dangerous jobs. It's something they're investigating now, but I'm told it is robust and ongoing. PSSI, the company we named, say that they have not been contacted by investigators. And the U.S. officials I spoke to who are familiar with this investigation said, look, at this point, the companies are not the target. They're still going to look at what the companies might have known. But at this point, it seems that it's part of a larger scheme. And then how is the Department of Homeland Security alleging these schemes worked out exactly? It would have been possibly, this is what they're looking into, that someone like a human smuggler would charge a fee to bring a child to the United States and then charge them an even higher fee to get them a job. Now, part of that job could be paying back that smuggler in order to get them there, but the smugglers would also be in charge of stealing the identities of Americans so that these children could then present that identification to get these jobs. Though former employees we spoke to from this first company said, look, it was obvious these children were not 18 years old. The scope the scope of the abuse by those smugglers is, is unbelievable. Okay, Julia Ainsley with a big uh, report for us tonight. It's a new development involving a criminal network that stretches from Los Angeles to New York to Chile and South America. Police in San Diego hunting a criminal gang they say is from Chile who are coming in on temporary visas, breaking into wealthy homes, and stealing millions in cash and valuables. NBC's Dana Griffin has the details. Tonight, authorities trying to track down these notorious burglars. San Diego police saying they suspect they are part of a Chilean crime ring. The criminals, highly coordinated, covered from head to toe, taunting security cameras in the mansions they rob in less than 15 minutes. They are up in their game. They're getting smarter as how they're acting and what they're doing. The Chilean nationals are suspected in at least 21 burglaries since December. San Diego police believe these crime tourists are hiding in nearby canyons. They plagued the area last year, but then went quiet until this recent string of robberies. In this heist, they made off with more than $80,000 in jewelry and heirlooms. They knew exactly what they were doing and where they were going. They just were like an organized group like you see in the movies. Police say these Chileans are entering the U.S. on 90-day visas, hitting some of the wealthiest neighborhoods across the country. Authorities are also looking into robberies in New York, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., New Jersey, and Florida that they believe were also carried out by this ring. 
We had a safe that was hidden in the back of the closet, bolted to the floor, um, had been um, ripped out of the floor and had been smashed open. In Long Island, New York, three Chileans were arrested in January of 2020, accused of committing burglaries across multiple states. In the Nassau County area alone, they probably count for 10 to 12 burglaries. Throughout the tri-state area, there's probably a couple of dozen burglaries. Police tracked the alleged burglars down to this house in Queens, New York, where they found the proceeds from multiple heists. This doorbell camera shows a suspect running away from police in Saddle Rock, New York. Investigators say at least two homes were targeted there, including one belonging to the town's mayor. That episode was a real punch in the gut. While these arrests were made in 2020, experts say even if these criminals are caught, the bail for nonviolent property offenses can be low or non-existent, giving them the chance to make a getaway or even fly back home with the score. Dana Griffin joins Top Story Live tonight from Los Angeles. Dana, I know you've been covering this story since you were in local news. And that last part of your report there is going to make people really upset. You're saying these people are getting out, these burglars who aren't even from this country, and they're released on low bail? Tom, that's right. So in the case that we mentioned from New York, one of the suspected burglars was released from jail because of new bail reform in late 2019. Two other burglars were also arrested, but they posted bond and disappeared. Police believe, Tom, they are back in Chile. Okay, Dana Griffin for us tonight. Dana, we thank you for that. When we come back, the new report on the mysterious illness known as Havana Syndrome. You may remember these bizarre cases of diplomats falling ill. It started in Cuba. What a years-long investigation by the CIA found about a possible cause. That's next. We are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly fire in Buffalo. New video, take a look at this, shows the fire exploding out of a building. Plumes of smoke also seen for miles. Officials say, unfortunately, a 37-year-old firefighter has died after he became trapped inside. No one else was hurt. The building is now being demolished. No word on what caused this fire. An update tonight on the so-called Havana Syndrome. A U.S. intelligence report concluded it was very unlikely the mysterious illness plaguing U.S. diplomats was caused by a foreign adversary or even an energy weapon. The report says a majority of cases can be explained by medical conditions or environmental and technical factors. Reports of the symptoms started in Havana, Cuba in 2016, but more than 1,500 cases have been documented in 96 countries. And drug maker Eli Lilly has announced it will be cutting the price of their insulin by 70%. The company is saying the out-of-pocket cost of the drug will now be capped at $35 a month. Welcome news for the roughly 30% of Americans with diabetes who get their insulin through Eli Lilly. It's unclear if other drug makers will follow suit. Okay, we head to Iran now, where local media is reporting hundreds of schoolgirls have been poisoned over the past several months. Officials originally ignoring these reports, but now say they could be intentional. The Iranian president publicly addressing the incidents for the first time today and now reportedly ordering an investigation. NBC's Josh Letterman has this story. Outside a high school in Tehran, confusion. About a dozen students apparently victims of poisoning. Local media reporting girls have been sickened in at least 30 schools across Iran. One Iranian lawmaker putting the number at about 900 students injured since November. This woman in Qom says it smells like cooking gas coming down into the classroom. While this schoolgirl says it made her feel dizzy, she says, my entire body feels very numb and it doesn't allow me to walk. But amid fears this is all a campaign to shut down girls' education, tonight, Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi taking action. Iranian state media reporting he's now tasking Iran's interior minister with investigating the cause and coordinating the response. A criminal investigation by the prosecutor general is also underway, a big step after senior Iranian officials had been downplaying the incidents as recently as today. Iran's deputy interior minister saying more than 99% of this is caused by stress, rumors and psychological war by hostile TV channels. He says their goal was to force schools to close. Unlike the Taliban in Afghanistan, Iran's theocratic government has not traditionally targeted girls for seeking an education. But other women's rights issues have been front and center for months, amid protests set off by the death in September of 22-year-old Masa Amini. 
Iran's morality police had detained her for allegedly violating Iran's law on headscarves for women. Hundreds more died in the protests that followed. Do you believe that what we're seeing right now is connected to the protests? There's no coincidence that it would suddenly happen at this moment, and the government knows that the protests are not dead. In Iran tonight, parents in fear, some reportedly pulling their kids out of class, as authorities vow to find out what is sickening Iran's school children and why. So far, Iran's government has not disclosed any deaths among the injured students. But amid all the confusion about what is going on, an Iranian state-run news agency says one boys' school was also targeted at the end of February. Tom? Okay, Josh Letterman with that troubling report. Coming up, a wild story out of Peru, a centuries-old mummified skeleton found inside a delivery cooler bag. Where the owner says he got it, this is a wild story that you won't believe. We are back now with Top Stories Global Watch. We begin with that deadly train tragedy in Greece, a passenger train traveling from Athens, crashing head-on with a freight train. More than 40 people killed and dozens injured. It's the deadliest accident in the country's history. No word yet on exactly what caused that crash, but Greece's prime minister is mostly blaming human error at this point. Now to a bizarre story out of Peru where authorities found a centuries-old mummy inside a delivery man's cooler bag. New video shows the mummified corpse, which is believed to be up to 800 years old, inside that bag. The owner telling police it's been in his family for 30 years and was passed down to him from his father. He is now under investigation. And an Australian-based professor is among three hostages released in Papua New Guinea. Bryce Barker and his research team leaving the island nation a week after they were captured by a criminal gang. Their release coming after a $41,000 ransom payment to the captors. Captors, though, still at large. Okay, when we come back, filtering reality. Have you heard about the new TikTok filter that's supposed to create an instant makeup look for users, but many say it's completely changing their face. You see it right here. So is it just a fun trend, or could it have harmful effects? We put it to the test. Stay with us. We are back now with a new viral TikTok filter used more than 8.5 million times. Some love how it makes them look, others hate it. Valerie Castro got the unfiltered view. You can't even tell it's a filter anymore. What do you think? Do I look better with it? <laughs> Definitely made my lips bigger. Bold glamour, the latest viral TikTok filter, is causing a stir. It has users divided over the way it instantly changes how they look compared to what they see in reality. This filter should be illegal. Here's the real me. Some are amazed. So this is you without it, right? You look yeah. normal. Okay, and this is you with the filter. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, what do you think about how you look? Um, I think it's amazing. <laughs> like some um, famous actress. But not everyone loves the look. Even actress Katherine Heigl saying this filter is not for me. I don't like it so much, no, I have to either. say. Why don't you like it? <laughs> I look Just a bit fake, fake. yes. Yeah. Too like perfect. What do you think? You have to live up to like this expectation, like this look that's not realistic, and it creates a world in your mind that doesn't exist. It's destructive to the identity. It's concerning. This is what a human face looks like. Content creator Hira Mustafa stunned by the new standard the filter is setting. What is it about bold glamour that makes it different from those other filters that we've seen? It was just a completely different face to me. The lips were larger, eyes were larger, skin tone was lighter. I've seen more people in, in my age group than ever pursue cosmetic surgeries to, to make their faces look more like these filters. And I worry about how this impacts young girls' confidence. A recent CDC study found that 57% of teenage girls reported feeling hopeless or sad. Many believe social media is among the causes for the drastic increase. We're going to see psychological consequences. Psychology professor Renee Englund has spent more than 20 years studying the effects of media and photo editing on women and girls. You could be forgiven for not even noticing that all of the faces you see are filtered all the time. She says when the filtered face you see is your own, it's a standard you might never be able to attain. It's one thing to compare yourself to like some famous beautiful person it's another thing to compare yourself 
to an extra beautiful version of yourself that doesn't exist in the world anywhere. TikTok hasn't responded to NBC's request for comment on the new filter, but in somewhat of an about face today, TikTok announcing new restrictions on screen time for users under 18, limiting them to 60 minutes a day before requiring a passcode to continue use. The company says it's all to promote parental involvement in their children's digital well-being. Do you think there needs to be more of that? Um, I would I would love to see that, especially for her. Brad Baker's daughter, Abby, is 16 years old. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? It doesn't look like me. <laughs> do you like it? You don't like it? I like it. I think it's cool. Well, I don't usually wear any makeup, so it's just kind of weird to see. Her dad, a high school teacher, also trying it out, seeing only subtle changes in his own face versus a drastic transformation in his daughter's appearance. Yeah, it gives me a little bit more color in the face and, you know, could be improved. A little bit more hair on top would be nice. <laughs> you know it is. Okay. Um, and what do you think about what it does to your daughter's face? Um, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see them having, I mean, it, you can tell it like definitely makes their lips bigger and like the, you know, the eyes with the makeup kind of stand out. I definitely yeah, like her like 10 times better in natural. All right, Valerie Castro joins us now in studio. So Valerie, we're going to put this new filter to the test. You're going to go first. Keep in mind, I have full TV yeah. makeup on. This is what the filter looks like. It looks like my cheekbones are a little oh, sucked yeah, in okay. here. A lot more eye makeup. Um, but why don't you take a try? What's the filter called again? Bold glamour. Bold glamour. That, that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, this is me looking into it, giving my blue steel face. <laughs> I can't look at both screens, but how, what, what's the biggest a difference? More tan. Okay. Lips look a little bit plumper. All right. Okay. I, I, I can see. I can see why people have fun with this. I can also see why that expert sees a real concern because when kids are younger and they see this, they may think, "Oh, I should look like this." So she's worried that this really creates an unattainable beauty standard. And even though we think that we can disregard the fact that this is a filter, tell ourselves this isn't real, your brain will make that comparison. It will look at the filter and then look at your face. And, and unfortunately, it will make the comparison. Right. You know, I think something else that was really important I want to go back to that was in your report. There's now this sort of restriction on TikTok. Tell us more about that. So the first part of the restriction is for kids under 18. It seems like the feature is meant to make them more aware of their screen time. But there's also a new 60-minute restriction restriction for kids under 13. TikTok says their parents will have to enter a passcode to allow them to use the app for another 30 minutes. Now, China's version of TikTok already has similar restrictions. It limits screen time over the course of the day and also a full ban on overnight use for those under 14. Those restrictions have been in place there for more than a year. Yeah, those restrictions for kids are always important because on any app, they can just spend hours scrolling. Valerie, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.